Hello everybody, welcome to chemistry. My name is Mr. Schmoke. I'm one of the three chemistry teachers um, that is gonna be working with you all this year. And while we all have individual classes, um, both myself, Ms. Thurlow and Ms. Huey have all uh, been working together and have, are doing our best to uh, give you a curriculum that is robust and easy to access and helpful. Please feel free at any time to reach out to any of the three of us for help, um, as you're gonna see us all in different videos of what's going on. First thing that we're gonna do this year is we're gonna review some of the things that you learned about last year. And in fact, probably have learned a little bit about since you started your schooling. Um, one of the most important things from my perspective and, and from the other chemistry teachers as well is that uh, in front of content that, that we were really focusing on problem solving and helping you to be a better problem solver, uh, helping with skills that you can use in your math class, your science classes, obviously, but also just in your general everyday life um, with dealing with problems and, and how to go about with a scientific way to solve them. Um, one of the first things that, that we think about often in science is measurement. And when we're measuring different things one way or the other, there's two words that you'll hear talked about often when we're making observations. Um, and that are things that are quantitative and things that are qualitative. Quantitative things are things that you can directly measure. The things that we're talking about here, length, temperature, time, volume, mass, all of those are quantitative, meaning we can put a number to them. Okay, I'm six foot, three inches tall. That's a quantitative measurement. If I want to say that qualitatively, I would say, Mr. Schmoke's a big guy, right? Um, that is kind of making something, but it's not an exact measurement. When we measure things qualitatively, we use units, okay? And there are two basic units that we use. We use, uh, in the United States, we're one of the very, very last countries on the planet to still use in the old English or standard, um, if you're ever looking in your toolbox and you pull out wrenches, it would say standard versus metric. But in science, we often say English versus SI, okay? So um, in science, we use the metric system, okay? We use the metric system because it's based on the number 10 and is easily translatable and it is globally known in the scientific community. So in this class, when you're making measurements, please make sure you're sticking with the metric units, okay? So what are the base metric units? The base metric units for length is the meter, okay? Which the abbreviation is a, is a lowercase m. For temperature, it is Kelvin, okay? And again, most of you have heard of Fahrenheit, which is what we commonly have. You know, your core body temperature is supposed to be at 98.6 degrees. Well, we're assuming there that it should be 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. If it was 98.6 Kelvin, or 98.6 degree, 98 degrees uh, Celsius, you would be dead. Time, the second kind of through all of them. Volume is the liter, although sometimes when we talk about volume, which I'm gonna talk about just in a little bit here, we could say cubic centimeter or cubic meter as well. And then the, the base unit for mass is the kilogram, okay? And so it is the gram, but the kilogram. It goes across there. That prefix takes us into the next section where we're going to start saying, looking at our prefixes. You did this last year, so hopefully this is a quick review that we can nail quickly. Hopefully you remember this uh, a little bit from last year, but prefixes are used in the metric system uh, and, and really lead us because everything is based on the number 10. And there are many, 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 many more prefixes than this. But these are the ones that we're going to expect you to know for this class. So I'm looking at it again, most of this should be a review for, for you. Terra means 10 to the 12th power. So if I said I had, um, there was a Terra meter, that would mean 10 to the 12th meters. So these prefixes are synonymous with these numbers, 10 to the times 10 to the 12th. Okay, giga would mean times 10 to the 9th, basically a billion. So if I said I had a, um, a, a, a gigagram, that's a million grams. If I said I had a, uh, a giga, uh, giga of money, I don't know 
why you'd say that, but it would mean that you have a billion dollars or a billion of whatever currency you're talking about. It's 10 to the ninth. Mega means 10 to the sixth, which is millions. So in the lottery, mega millions means literally millions of millions. Kilo means a thousand or 10 to the third. Hecto, one we didn't do last year, means 10 to the second. Centi means 10 to the negative second, means one one hundredth of something. So a cent, like if you pull a penny out, that's a cent, that's one one hundredth of a dollar bill. Um, milli, like millennium. Uh, one year is one one thousandth of a millennium. Milli means one one thousandth or 10 to the negative third. Micro, 10 to the negative six. Nano, 10 to the negative ninth. And pico, 10 to the negative twelfth. And so you should know all of those prefixes and the number associated with them. It will be very important when you're problem solving and when you're doing your dimensional or unit analysis. And I always encourage my students to come up with kind of their own mnemonic device to remember these. So I thought of one just off the top of my head. I'm out of practice, so it took me a little longer. To get many killer hot chips, my mom never pretzels. It doesn't make any sense at all. But if I get that in my head, as I'm going through, at least for the ones that I need to know, I can say two, that's Terra, get, that's Giga, many, mega, and so on, okay? Um, these are things, though, that you have to memorize. So my advice for students is always, when you get this, make some flashcards and put the, the name on one side and the number associated with the other, and just practice them back and forth, and before you know it, you're gonna have all of your prefixes down for the metric system. All right, we have units because measurement is such a huge part of science. Again, going from that qualitative, talking about something being big or small or hot or short or et cetera, et cetera, to putting specific numbers to it. Those numbers come from somewhere and they come from our ability to measure. Having great techniques helps our data and overall then our, all of our studies in science to be much better and more accurate. When we measure things, we use different tools. And we'll talk about those tools here in a second, but many of them you've already used. You've used uh, volumetric flasks or things that are gonna hold the liquid and are gonna measure volume. You've used meter sticks and rulers and tape measures, et cetera, to measure length. Quite often you've used a scale to measure your weight but we use also balances to measure mass, okay? We'll talk later about the difference between mass and weight. Um, when we're talking about measurements, you're often gonna hear two terms thrown around, and for people who are not so scientifically inclined, they often use these two words interchangeably, and they don't mean the same thing. Accuracy and precision mean two different things. Accuracy is talking about a specific measurement, one specific measurement. How close is it to the actual value of that measurement? Okay. Um, oftentimes, when we're talking about two things, you'll see graphics and textbooks and on um, PowerPoints and etc. showing a dartboard to talk about the difference. I'm going to talk something close to me. I'm going to talk about my weight. Okay. So I'm going to use pounds, even though pounds is is uh, one of our old standard or English measurements because it's something you're familiar with. Okay. If I went and got, got on the greatest balance in the world and found out that I weighed 215 pounds, exactly, and every time I got onto a scale at home, it said 218 pounds, that wouldn't be very accurate. It would be close, I suppose, but depending on your um, percent error, you could find for that. We'll talk about that as well. Uh, if it said 115 pounds, I'd say, wow, that's really accurate. If it said 230 pounds, then I would throw it out the window, but I would say this is really not accurate at all. Precision is, is a little bit different than accuracy, though. Precision is looking at how close are your subsequent measurements, meaning that if I got on my scale and it said 230 pounds, and then I stood off, and then I got back on, it said 230 pounds again, then I got off, and then it said 231 pounds, and then it said 230 pounds again and again. While that wouldn't be very accurate, that scale would be fairly precise because each measurement was the same. If I got on my scale one day and it said 215 pounds, I stepped off it, then I stepped right back onto the scale and it said 220 pounds. One of those measurements was very accurate. The other measurement was 
more accurate than my scale that always reads 230 pounds, uh, um, but it wouldn't be precise at all. It would have no precision to it. What we're hoping to do is when we make measurements is be both accurate and precise. The precision of your instrument and the accuracy has a lot to do with how it's manufactured and everything else. We don't use in, in high school chemistry um, necessarily the most precise instruments that we have available because they're very, very expensive. When we do get back in class, I'm hoping that we're going to have an opportunity to use some pipettes and burettes and some other things. And you will notice that your teachers are much more careful with those devices um, because they're made of glass and because they're much more expensive. The more accurate and precise your measurement device, uh, the more effort it takes to manufacture it and the more expensive it usually is. And whenever we measure something, we, it's always our job to estimate one digit. We're always trying to estimate one digit. And so I'm going to go into that estimation of that digit next and see how do we do that and what does that look like? And it really depends on, again, the instrument that you're using. Unfortunately, the ruler that I have up here, I don't know that will show that well up uh, on the video here and give you kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about estimating a digit. So instead, I, I drew some measurement devices on the board to kind of give us an idea or some models. Obviously, my measurement devices are neither accurate nor precise, but I'm just using them as an example of what I'm talking about when I'm saying estimate one digit. If we look at the length of something, so let's say I have a straw here. I have a drinking straw or uh, whatnot. And let's say I have three different meter sticks or rulers or something that I'm measuring length with, okay? And the first one, it just goes from zero to 10 centimeters, okay? And the second one goes from zero to 10 centimeters, but it has hash marks or delineations for each centimeter itself. And then I have a third one that goes from zero to 10 centimeters, but it actually breaks it down all the way to the 10th of a centimeter or the millimeter. Now the length of my straw doesn't change, but how I would, could express that if I was measuring the length of that straw using these three different rulers would change. So if I'm using the first ruler, the only thing that I know for certain is that this straw is somewhere between zero and 10 centimeters long, okay? So I can estimate a digit in there. So I might look at that and say, well, this is about halfway and this is a little bit more so I'm going to say that this is six centimeters long and you can do that. And that would be the correct way to write that answer. Um, now let's look down here. Oh, geez, I was way off. If I'm comparing with this one, if I look here, I go, I know that it's more than seven centimeters, but it's less than eight. So again, I look here and I would say, well, it's about halfway in between. Um, so I'm going to say that's seven Point five centimeters, okay? And then I go to my next rule and I go, this actually breaks it down to the tenth of a centimeter. And when I do that, I can go, oh, let's see, it goes one, two, three, four, five, six. And it's a little bit more than 7.6, a little bit more, not very much at all. So I'm gonna say my measurement there is 7.6 two centimeters. Now the length of that raw of, of, of that straw hasn't changed. And while certainly there could be much to be desired with my methods of going about and measuring this, that I start at the end correctly? Am I looking at it right? But any of those errors are going to be user, user errors. They're not going to be experimental errors. Experimental errors are errors that are inherent to the, the equipment that you have given to you. This is much less precise. A lot of people are going to have much different things than this would be, okay? It doesn't say anything for any of their accuracies, but it's, we know it's much less precise. Six centimeters would be an acceptable answer. You say, well, what's right and what's wrong? Well, with this, that would be a perfectly acceptable answer, six centimeters, because we, we don't know. But for this one, if you put six centimeters, it would be wrong on a lot of levels. One, not only... Can you estimate it? You have to estimate. So you know it's greater than seven and you know it's less than eight. So you just would have to have some number here. Now, if you're good at measurement, if you can see, uh, if you have depth perception, I don't know, um, you're going to say it's somewhere halfway in between. 
This one, we have to break it down even further because this one actually measures all the way to the tenth of a centimeter. So we have to estimate to the thousandth. So whatever your measurement tool goes to, whatever the smallest unit is, you have to estimate one unit past then to be acceptable, okay? We can do the same thing when we're looking at volume. When we measure volume, first of all, it's important to note that often we're measuring the volume of something that is water-based, something that is polar, and we're going to talk about what that means. But because of that, it sticks to the sides of things, okay? It's called adhesion, something else we'll talk about. Um, so where do we measure this from? Do we measure it from the top of where the water is or the bottom? We call this little dip a meniscus, okay? And with different kinds of liquids, ones that are not polar, okay, we would actually have an inverse of this, okay? But we're always going to measure from the bottom of the meniscus. So if we're measuring from here and measuring here, what do you think your measurement would be? These are both in milliliters. They both measure to 100 milliliters, but this one is broken down into tens. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 milliliters. So if I was using this one, I could say to myself, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. I know it's more than 70, but it's less than 80. So for this, we could say something like, I think it's 73 milliliters. I can estimate to the ones position because my measurements here are to the tens position. This just goes from zero to 100. So I can, if, if I think they're in powers of 10, that means I can only put an an answer and express it to the tens. So I might say, okay, this looks like, I'm gonna say this is 70 milliliters, okay? So you have to do that. When we do that, we bring back this term called significant figures or significant digits. Significant figures and significant digits can be annoying at times, I get that, because you go, why is 10 not 10? Why is that not true? And it's because we're telling you in our answer, by how many digits I put, the precision abilities of the measurement tool that I'm using. All right, continue our discussion on significant figures. Again, significant figures are important because it shows us the level of the precision of the tools you're using. If I was to go to a machine shop and say, you know, I, I need to get um, a piece of steel that is one inch thick in diameter and um, 10 feet long, it probably wouldn't cost me that much money. If I said one inch thick diameter and 10 feet long, because what I'd be indicating is, okay, it's gotta be about an inch thick and it's gotta be about 10 feet long. It's gotta be less than, less than 100 and more than zero. But if I went in and I asked for the same thing and I said, I need the diameter to be 1.000, inches and I need the length to be 10.0000 feet or something like that, that would be something completely different. And that's not something that you recognize in probably your math course. You say one is one. 1. 1.000 is the same as one. And 10.0000 is the same as 10. And they could be, but not necessarily so. And what I mean by that is if I'm outside and I'm building a little uh, box for my wife to, to make her garden in, I can use fairly archaic estimated um, measurements. If I'm going to be doing heart surgery or I'm going to be flying to outer space in the space shuttle, I want the measurements as far out as I can, as precise as I can, and hopefully, hopefully as accurate as I can. So yes, significant figures matter and they will continue to matter and they'll matter more and more and more the farther you'll get into your science courses, okay? So what are our rules for significant figures if I'm just looking at numbers? Which numbers are significant and which numbers aren't when I'm just looking at the measurements that somebody has done, okay? And here are the rules. And again, I know this is review, so I'm going to go through them rather quickly. Number one, non-zeros are always significant. So that would be like one, two, three, four, you get the picture. One through nine are significant, okay? Well, how about those zeros? Well, zeros can fall under three different rules, okay? Leading zeros are never significant. So if zeros are just coming before a non-zero, 
They're never significant. Doesn't matter if they're before a decimal, after a decimal, anything else. Leading zeros are never significant. And that's when the number that you're reading starts with a zero. Those are never significant, okay? They're just placeholders. They're just placeholders, okay? Captured zeros are always significant. Captured zeros are zeros that come between any two non-zeros, like 2002, okay? The year 2002, 2002. These are both captured zeros, so yes, they are, in fact, significant, okay? They are significant, okay? Um, and usually captured zeros do pretty well. It's an ominous sounding thing, captured zeros. And really, the only non-zeros that you don't want to be caught between are sevens. Because sevens are diabolical. And if you didn't know that, all you need to know is seven, eight, nine. The cannibalistic numbers. That always goes over really big when there's when there's a group of kids, and it really doesn't. For those of you who had me last year, I, I tried it. I do it every year. It gets less of a laugh every year, okay? Trailing zeros might be significant. They might not be significant. So trailing zeros are zeros that end a number. If you have a one or a series of zeros that end a number, the question then becomes, is there a decimal present? If there's a decimal present, those are significant. They're there, not as placeholders, but to show significance. If there's no decimal present, they're not significant. So let's look at some numbers here and let's ask ourselves how many significant figures are there? I'm hoping that you can see these okay, but this first one, 200 centimeters. How many significant figures are there? Hopefully you said one. A two is a non-zero. It is obviously significant because it's not a zero. And these are trailing zeros, but there's no decimal point. Yes, there's an assumed decimal point there, but there's a decimal point not written. So we know that there's only one significant figure for this one. 1SF, significant figure. How about this one? Well, there's the two. We know that that is significant. So the question is, are these three zeros significant? Well, are they captured zeros? Are they leading zeros? Or are they trailing zeros? And they're leading zeros. They're only there as placeholders. So because they just come in front, they're not significant. This also only has one significant figure. How about this number, 2005? Again, the non-zero is pretty easy. A two and a five, always significant because they're non-zeros. How about these two zeros? Well, they're in the middle, meaning they're captured, thankfully not by a seven. So yes, they are both significant. Captured zeros are always significant. So there's four significant figures here, okay? How about this one now? Again, the two, we know that's significant. How about this? What is this? This is a leading zero. This comes before a non-zero. There's no other non-zeros in front of it. Leading zero, never significant. How about these two? They're trailing zeros. So the question is, is there a decimal present? There is. So they're not here as placeholders. They're here to show significance. So in this, there's three significant figures. And so for that, important. Now, we look at this one, 200 dogs. How many significant figures are there in 200 dogs? You say, oh, Mr. Schmoke, I remember this one because it's 200 centimeters, so there's one. No. In fact, then you went back and went, ah, there's the trick. If we're counting something, then all the digits are significant, and it's an unlimited. You can't limit that. If I say there's, there's 10 kids sleeping while watching this video right now, there's 10 kids. It's not like a half a kid, okay? Every one of you is meaningful and is counted as one. So that's how it is. So this, we would say, this has an infinite number of significant figures when, we look, when I look at it. And really, when it comes down to it, we, we give the number of significant figures, but it really comes down to what place. So this is only significant to the hundreds place. This is, uh, this you can't really even say is significant to that particular place. Um, or actually, you can. You can say this is significant to that place, but the other three zeros don't end up coming into play. To the ones place, this is significant all the way out. Let's see, we got tenths, hundreds, thousands, ten thousandths place, pretty good. And this, an infinite number, because nobody is just a part of something, they're a whole something, okay? So that is significant digits and counting. Let's talk about significant digits then when we actually derive units, okay? So we talked about base units. Base units are um, our base for length, width, uh, excuse me, length, mass, time, temperature, etc. 
How about derived units when we start multiplying or adding things together? What does that do to our number significant figures? And if you remember from last year, we have two different rules. One rule for when we add and subtract, and one rule for when we multiply and divide significant figures. All right, calculating significant figures. When we're calculating significant figures, it's important to know that in any derived measurement where we're multiplying or adding or, or anything else, we are basically hampered by whatever, whichever of our measurements is the least significant. And there's all sorts of analogies that go along with this, that you know a team is only as strong as its weakest member, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And these derived measurements, these calculations could only be as strong or only be as precise as the least accurate measurement that goes, goes into it. So what are the rules that go for that, if you remember? Well, for addition and subtraction, the rule is whichever number in your calculation has the least number of decimal places, okay, has the least number of decimal places, goes the least number of decimal places to the right. Whichever one goes that, that's going to dictate your final answer, okay? Now, that's different than multiplication and division. That takes out of account anything about really how many decimal places and just looks at how many total significant figures there are. So whichever number, and, and I should say for both these, whichever measurement has the least number of significant figures dictates the final number of significant figures. So what does that look like? Well, I wrote some, some problems up here that we can look at. Again, always including units and signs, always include units. You, numbers themselves don't mean anything. They don't mean anything. Um, if I got a note in the mail today that says you just, uh, we're, we're announcing to you that you just won a thousand. Uh, that could be a really good thing or a really bad thing. If I won a thousand dollars, I would be, uh, thrilled. Okay. Um, if I won a thousand, uh, days of hard labor, I don't know, I'd be winning. That wouldn't be good. So numbers themselves are undefined. We need to make sure to define them by putting in a unit. So here we have five centimeters plus two centimeters. You're like, oh, I know that answer. It's seven. But is it seven? Is it 7.0? Is it seven? Is it seven point? Well, when I look here, I say to myself, this number goes to the ones position, significantly to the ones position. This one goes to the tenths position. This is more precise than this but my answer can only go to the position that it is. So in this particular case, my answer would be seven centimeters would be the correct way to, to do it. And I've often found it helpful to line up, like at least we used to learn how to add and subtract when I was in school, which is lining up the decimal points. So I would put 5.0 plus two. And when I do that, it's pretty easy for me to see that this doesn't go as far to the right as this one does. And I draw a line there, I go, okay, that's a zero there. There's my decimal point. And this is a seven. Everything to the left, I keep. Everything to the right, I discard. Now, again, we're going to round using that figure. We can use that to help us round, but it's not going to be a part of the answer, and the answer is going to be seven. How about if we flip it here? What if you have 3.510 minus 1.5? So again, I'm going to use the exact same method as I did up here. I'm going to take my 3.510 millimeters and I'm going to subtract 1.5 millimeters. Okay. And again, I can see that this one only goes to the tens place. Well, this one goes all the way to the thousands place. Woo. Okay. So I still put those in. Zero, one, I subtract. Five minus five is zero. And three minus one is two. So you go, okay, well, that's, what, it, what, what, is the, what is my answer then? Well, I go, I know that I can only have these two digits. That's it. My answer can only go to the tenths position because this is to the tenths position. Sorry, I'm, but I, I want to make sure to distinguish it from tens. Tenths versus tens. Not very linguistic. Um, and I look and I go, well, that's a, that's a one. So, Really, for us right now, if this is anything between 0 and 4, we're going to leave this number the same. If this number over here is anywhere between 5 and 9, we're going to move this up one digit. In this particular case, then, this answer would be 2.0 millimeters. Put my units, everything's good. Okay, correct number of significant figures. How about here now, I'm multiplying. 1.0 times 6. Now, this doesn't matter 
how many places, it just matters on significant figures. So I go one times six, one times six is six, if I put it in my calculator. This only has one significant figure, this has two, but my answer can only have one because this has the least number, uh, number of significant figure than it's one. So then when I put six centimeters, no, when I'm adding and subtracting, I gotta make sure I have the same units. But when I'm multiplying and dividing, I'm just taking that unit times the other unit. These are both the same units, and it would behoove you to always make them the same units when you're multiplying and dividing. So I can just put centimeters times centimeters. That would be one way to write it, centimeters times centimeters. Is there an easier way to write that than, a, than the same thing multiplied by itself? Sure, we can use an exponent. Another way to write that would be six centimeters squared, okay? Easy to do. How about this? This is also one times six. Is, would I get the same answer? And the answer is no, because this has two significant figures and this has two significant figures. So my answer must have two significant figures. I type it in my calculator, all I get is six. So what does that mean? I gotta add a significant figure, boom. Means that this is precise to the tenths position in all my measurement. Again, centimeters squared. How about this, two times six? Well, you're like, I know that, that's 12. In this particular case, it's not 12. It's not 12 square centimeters. That, that would not be the correct answer. What would be the correct answer? How many significant figures could I have? Well, this is one significant figure. If that's one significant figure, I can only have one. So I go 12, the, I, I can only have one. It's gonna be the one farthest to the left. A two does not round this up and I can just put 10 centimeters squared. And you go, well, isn't that two centimeters? And I, or isn't that two significant figures? No, because this is a trailing zero without a decimal present, okay? Now, you could also write that number and express it easily using something called scientific notation. I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute. All right, scientific notation. Scientific notation, it's kind of a shorthand for numbers that we use often in math and science. It allows us to save space and, and write things in a much more concise manner here. So, what are my rules for scientific notation? Rule number one, you, guys, you can only have one number that comes before the decimal or to the left of the decimal. We do our problems from left to right, top to bottom. So it'd be top left, that, that number, there can only be one before the decimal. Two, we can only include the, the, our figures which are significant. So whatever numbers are significant from that measurement, those are the only ones we're including with scientific notation. We're not gonna include any numbers that are not significant. Three, the number of places that I have to move my decimal is going to become the exponent of 10. Okay, so if, if, if I have to move my decimal three places to get one number to the left of that decimal, then my exponent will be three. Doesn't matter what direction you have to move your decimal, the exponent's three. Now, if you move that number, or if, if you move that number uh, to the left, that means that the number was greater than one. And that means that your exponent is going to be positive. If you move your number to the right, the number of places you have to move is to the right, that means that that number was less than one, which means that your exponent has to be negative. So what am I talking about? What, is that, what does that actually look like? Okay, let's take a number like 12,000 liters. The first thing we have to do with this measurement is we've got to determine how many significant figures are there in this number. What's significant? Well, the one and the two are, because those are non-zeros, how about these three zeros, significant or not? I'm waiting for your answer. Uh, not significant. Why? They're trailing zeros and there's no decimal presence. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to just write out my numbers. Those are the only significant ones, okay? Now, I can only have one before the decimal. I can only have one number before the decimal, that's here. So how do I go from my decimal being here, even though it's not written, I know it's there. I had to move it how many places? One, two, three, four places. I had to move it four places. So I write in my times 10 and I write four up here. Okay. And I ask myself, is 12,000 greater than one or less than one? It's greater than one. I moved it to the left. It's greater than one. So my number is 1.2 times 10 to the fourth. Don't forget your units. You have to define your numbers. 1.2 times 10 to the fourth liters would be the right way to, the correct way to write this in scientific notation. 0. 0.00012 meters. Again, I ask myself, which of these numbers is significant? Again, the two and the one are, because they're not zeros. How about these three zeros? 
Nope, not significant. Why? They're leading zeros. They're only here to hold the place. So again, it's just going to be these two numbers. And again, I can only have one come before the decimal, to the left of the decimal. Then I have to ask myself, well, how many places did I have to move the decimal? Well, it started here, and I had to move it one, two, three, four places. So I put times 10 to the fourth. Except for this number, this time I had to move my decimal place to the right. And if I look at the number, we go, oh, that's less than one. So this has to be a negative number. And again, I don't want to forget because... 1.2 times 10 to the fourth liters is much different than 1.2 times 10 to the negative fourth meters, okay? How about this number? Again, what, what's significant? Well, I know the one and the five are. How about all the zeros? When I look at it, I go, this zero is captured. It's between a one and a five. It doesn't matter if there's one zero between those two or 12 zeros between the two. All of them would be significant. Any zeros that come between non-zeros are significant. How about these? Are these captured zeros? And the answer is no, they're not. They're trailing zeros, so they're not significant. But I'm going to write down the numbers that are significant. I had a 1, a 0, and a 5. And again, I can only have one number to the left of my decimal, so that comes there. So we know that my decimal started here. How many places did I have to move it? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 places times 10 to the 6th. Grand. And finally, this one down here, significant, significant. How about the zeros captured? Yes. Trailing with a decimal? Yes. These two? Nope. Leading. Two, zero, five, zero. Again, decimal point after the first number. I can only have one number to the left. How many places did I have to move it? One, two, three places. So times 10 to the third. And this number is less than one. I had to move my decimal to the right. So it's negative three. You don't forget your units here. And if we're going in the opposite direction, we just do the exact opposite. So if I had a number over here, and I'm just gonna write one up here in red, so you can see, it says something like 3.2 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. close to being a significant number, not quite. But if I look at this um, and I said, okay, I wanna write this number out. I'm gonna write out my significant ones. I'm gonna say 3.2, okay, that's good. And it's times 10 to the eighth, which means that we had to move the decimal eight places. And we know it's greater than one, so now if I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna move to the right. So I just put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is literally how my chemistry teacher taught me how to do it in high school. And I know that different teachers are going to do it different ways, but I always put the humps in. It still helps me to visually see it. Each of these humps, there becomes a zero. Boom. So now I got those zeros there. So that number ends up being out three, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes. Seven zeros. Boom. Put in some commas. Woo-hoo! 320 million meters per second. Very fast. That's scientific notation. Tomorrow I'm going to start doing another video here and, and edit it and put it together. Hopefully this one ended up great. Again, regardless of your class, I really encourage all of you to visit each of the chemistry teachers, whether in person when we get back or online, because I think we're all going to have a little bit different perspectives and a little bit different ways of talking to this. And at least one of them is going to resonate with you, I'm sure, because both Miss Huey and Miss Thurlow are amazing people and amazing teachers. So I'm hopeful that this was helpful to you. And uh, I'll be back tomorrow to talk about now how are we going to use this for in dimensional analysis and talking a little bit more.